with Michelle McCory. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and Ilan Omar slammed Israel's decision to bar their planned trip to the Palestinian territories. They repeatedly referred to the so-called occupation and claim that Israel implements racist policies. And they also implied that the US government should reconsider the financial and military aid that America sends to Israel. Fortunately, we in the United States have a constructive role to play. We give Israel more than $3 million in aid every year. This is predicated on their being an important ally in the region and the only democracy in the Middle East. But denying visit to duly elected members of Congress is not consistent with being an ally and denying millions of people freedom of movement or expression or self-determination is not consistent with being a democracy. We must be asking, as Israel's ally, the Netanyahu government stop the expansion of settlements on Palestinian land and ensure full rights for Palestinians if we are to give them aid. Now, during the news conference, Israel was also repeatedly labeled as racist and oppressive and comparisons to the apartheid regime of South Africa were made very liberally. History does have a habit of repeating itself. I learned this week that a former member of Congress, Congressman Charles C. Diggs Jr., was denied entry into apartheid South Africa in 1972. He was also the representative for the 13th Congressional District in Michigan. Now, it's not entirely clear exactly what or where Tlaib and Omar were talking about when they repeatedly mentioned, quote, the occupation. That is because Israel fully pulled out of the Palestinian territory of Gaza in 2005. The Arab areas of the West Bank have enjoyed a significant measure of self-rule since the Oslo Accords were put into effect in 1994. And that includes the area near the town of Ramallah, where Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib's grandmother lives. Now, the story is also making an impact on Israeli politics. For more on that, let's go live to Tel Aviv and I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Mike Wagon. Hi, Mike. Good to have you with us. A lot to dissect here. First of all, we heard from representatives Omar and Tlaib and uh, they, uh, their itinerary. They're claiming that Prime Minister Netanyahu was lying when he said that there were no visits scheduled with Israeli members of Knesset. Now, the official agenda, from what we saw, did not include any visits with Israelis. So, Mike, has any Israeli member of Knesset come out and said that they did have a meeting scheduled? Has anyone corroborated their claim that even though this wasn't on the schedule, they were indeed going to meet with Israeli leaders and get their perspective? There's been one, and that's been Ida Tuma Soliman, the uh, Christian Arab member of the Hadash party, which Omar said she had a meeting set up. Uh, Soliman did, in fact, confirm that. The other security officials that Omar alluded to that she had meetings uh, set up with, nobody has come forward. There's been nobody on the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, which would be the uh, counterpart of the uh, House Committee that Omar serves on. Nobody's come forward and, and claimed that they had a meeting set up, and no other members of Knesset either. So that uh, information still is uncorroborated at this point. All right. Uh, Mike, representatives Omar and Tlaib talked a lot about security checkpoints, but they didn't mention the terrorism that led to those security points, did they? I mean, do we know if their delegation was uh, planning any kind of visit to try and address the terrorist issue? Were they planning to talk to the terrorist groups Hamas or Islamic Jihad or, or if not go that far, perhaps address the Palestinian pay for slave program? No indication that any meetings were set up with Hamas or Palestinian Jihad, and no indication that the Pay for Slave program, the uh, program administered by the Palestinian Authority, which uh, pays money, uh, salaries to terrorists and their families each month, no indication that that would be addressed, unlike the other Democratic uh, representatives who were here in the past week addressed that uh, with uh, PA President Mahmoud Abbas. The trip itself was funded by MIFTA, which is an organization that has shown uh, sympathy uh, to terrorists. It's run by Hanan Ashwari, the founding member, who's a Palestinian legislator. And by the way, 
Her visa was uh, denied by the United States in the most recent attempt to visit the country. So uh, there has been a precedent for that. And now Israel uh, responding uh, likewise and not allowing uh, uh, MIFTA to run tours uh, in Israel either. Mike, uh, the representatives referred to the occupation. As we mentioned, Israel did withdraw from Gaza in 2005. The West Bank is run by the Palestinian Authority. There are, of course, the disputed territories in the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, as Jews refer to it. So is, is that what they were referring to when they were talking about the occupation throughout this news conference? Yeah, it's a big distinction, occupied territories versus disputed territories. Make a long history short. 1948, the Israeli War of Independence breaks out. 1949, after it's clear Israel would win, armistice lines were set with Egypt and with Jordan. Those armistice lines were eventually supposed to turn into borders. They still haven't. 70 years later, eventually Jordan attacked Israel uh, in 1967. Israel wound up liberating the, uh, the lands in eastern Jerusalem and in the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. The pre-1967 borders, which you hear about, are still those armistice lines from 1949. But when you have, quote-unquote, borders, then you can have, quote-unquote, occupation. Israel claims these are disputed territories, not occupied territories. All right, Mike, we also understand that Israel's ambassador to the U.S., Ron Derma, he's been getting heat from all angles on this. Top Democratic lawmakers reportedly were considering putting out a statement of no confidence in Derma. And he's also been taking a lot of the blame for this in Israel because he initially said that Israel would allow these anti-Israel congresswomen into the country. So break down this whole saga for us. Really surprising. Ron Dermer was the architect of Benjamin Netanyahu's speech uh, to the U.S. Congress uh, against the will of President at the time Barack Obama to try to thwart the Iran nuclear accord. Dermer is considered incredibly close to Netanyahu. He put out a statement on air a few weeks ago saying that the sitting members of U.S. Congress, uh, Tlaib and uh, Omar, would be welcome in Israel regardless of their views. However, uh, in the past few days, Foreign Minister Yisrael Katz also considered relatively close to Netanyahu, came out on live TV and said that uh, Dermer made that statement without consultation of Katz, without consultation of Netanyahu. Uh, documents uh, have proven that to be false. So the question lies, who's correct, who's right at this point, and why has Katz thrown uh, Dermer under the bus? Netanyahu said uh, that Dermer made that statement without the knowledge of the itinerary, which showed that, that it would be a very one-sided trip. Uh, Dermer, it was reported within the last week or so that Benjamin Netanyahu sees Dermer as one of two possible successors to him. Meanwhile, Yisrael Katz wants that spot as well in a post-Netanyahu era as prime minister. So was Katz jostling for position in the long term by throwing Dermer under the bus? Was he upset, possibly, that during his last trip to Washington, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo did not meet with Katz, which is incredibly rare for a foreign minister to uh, visit Washington? Maybe Katz thought... Uh, that the Dermer didn't give enough, enough help in trying to set up that meeting. Who knows the reasons in the end, but certainly it's creating a rift between Katz and Dermer. A lot of fallout from this decision, Israel and the U.S. Mike Wagenheim, thank you. And we will have more on this controversy after the break. Keep it here. You're watching Clear Cut. Welcome back. I'm Michelle McCory. Let's now dig deep into what was and wasn't said. In today's news conference with Representatives Omar and Tlaib, for that we bring in our senior Washington correspondent, Dan Raviv. Dan, a lot to break down here. Firstly, a number of times during today's news conference, Representative Omar spoke in a fairly threatening manner about the $3 billion in aid that the U.S. sends to Israel every year. Actually, Omar mistakenly said $3 million, not $3 billion. But uh, besides that era, how far have these representatives taken this agenda to cut aid to Israel? And is that something that other, other Democrats support? So far, it's just words. They did say that as an ally and an aid recipient, Israel should not be blocking members of Congress from going there. Uh, in addition, Omar said that if Israel is receiving aid, then settlement expansion in the West Bank should stop and Palestinians should have their rights. Now, these thoughts or demands are not new, and Omar may well bring them up in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, where she's a member. But I think it's safe to say that almost all the Democrats, including the chairman, Elliot Engel, will not be interested in cutting aid to Israel. Republicans certainly will reject that idea. And you probably know that almost all members of Congress feel that the aid is a good investment for America's security, Michelle.
Right. Uh, although we have heard uh, similar sentiment expressed uh, by Senator Bernie Sanders, who, as we know, is uh, running to be the mm. Democratic candidate. Uh, there was reportedly, Dan, some discussion about a resolution from the Democrats in the House condemning Israel's decision. So where does that stand? Is, is Speaker Pelosi doing anything to stop it, perhaps? Well, think about it. If Congress had been in session last week when all of this was unfolding, there really is a chance that the House, controlled by Democrats, might have passed some resolution criticizing Israel. And in fact, this past weekend, there was talk among congressional staffers of a resolution that might criticize two proxies for Netanyahu and Trump. By that, I mean the Israeli ambassador here, Ron Dermer, and the U.S. ambassador in Jerusalem, David Friedman, for applauding the cancellation of the Congresswoman's visit. Now, some members of Congress may still feel that way, but in fact, Congress is still in its recess for another more than two weeks. Question, will this still be a hot issue in September? Michelle? Mm, that's a good question, Dan. Both Congresswomen, as we know, have a history of making anti-Semitic comments. Uh, they've been criticized it for, for it in the past. And this weekend, they promoted a cartoon drawn by a Holocaust trivializer, someone who actually came in second in Iran's international Holocaust cartoon contest. I mean, it's hard to believe that there is a Holocaust cartoon contest, but there is such a thing. This guy came in second, and then they retweeted one of his cartoons. Tell us more about this cartoon, the controversy, and, and whether they were asked about this in this press conference. I saw it on the in, yeah, I saw it on the Instagram feeds of both of the congresswomen, uh, Talib and Omar. Uh, a political cartoon they apparently liked. Uh, have a look. It's based on the flag of Israel. You see the star of David in the middle and uh, stripes, blue stripes above and below, showing Netanyahu and Trump using their hands to silence Talib and Omar. But now we know the cartoonist is Carlos Latouf. He's a Lebanese-Brazilian artist who did win that prize in Iran for artwork suggesting that Israel is committing a kind of holocaust against the Palestinians. No, the congresswomen were not asked if they regret linking themselves in any way with that artist, Michelle. Well, a big headline coming out of the West Bank today, Dan, was that the Palestinian Authority was cracking down on LGBTQ activism. Were they asked to address that, uh, the Palestinian Authority banning the LGBTQ community? Did they perhaps use this opportunity to speak out against the PA's ban on the LGBTQ community? At that news conference in the Minnesota state capitol, no, nothing on gay rights uh, or on Israel as the only country in the Middle East that has gay rights, a big gay pride celebration every year. Of course, Talib and Omar would say that the point of the news conference was for them to talk about Israeli oppression and how horrible it was to, as they put it, silence them. Though, of course, in Minnesota they had plenty to say and on social networks at all. In fact, no one pushed Talib to explain why she didn't take advantage this past Friday of Israel's offer to let her fly in and visit her grandmother in the West Bank. At first, she had agreed in writing not to talk about boycotting Israel while there. Later, she claimed that that condition was making her feel like a criminal. She said it was Israeli oppression. Michelle? All right. Uh, Dan, before we let you go, we understand that the representatives were also addressing the controversial organization MIFTA, which was a co-sponsor of this trip. Let's take a listen to what they had to say. Yeah, yeah, that's we, a, that's a really uh, good question. We um, we were, had our colleagues yeah. that are senior members. Some of them have served multiple terms. Actually, told us about the organization, and because we asked, you know, we're not the ones who chose the organization. A U.S. Foundation, a U.S.-based sponsor organization chose it. But I was told by a number, I think there was five members of Congress that actually Just went in 2016. on a trip that was sponsored by the same organization. So uh, we're also taken aback and, and learned from everybody else that there were some issues regarding it. Uh, Dan, give us a little bit more information about this organization. We understand that this is an organization that in the past promoted the blood libel, the notion that Jews make matzah using the blood of Christian babies over Passover. What do we know about yeah, Miftah? Sure. 
Yeah, here on Clearcut, we were looking at Miftah, which is based in the West Bank, headed by Hanan Ashrawi. And indeed, it seems that the itinerary for the two congresswomen, at least in what they call Palestine, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, was Miftah's creation. Now, that group is sometimes thought of as pro-peace, but if you look at their various announcements about events, for instance, stabbing attempts uh, by Palestinians aimed at, at, at Jews, and then if it ends with gunfire from Israeli soldiers or police, they call that an assassination by Israeli forces. And at one point, indeed, Miftah had to apologize for writing that it was bad for Barack Obama to host a Passover Seder in the White House because Passover is linked with the use of, of blood by, it, it, by Jews. It's all terrible, of course. So Miftah suddenly has a bad reputation, and you could see the two congresswomen revealing that they never really thought about who was organizing their trip. Michelle? Right. All right, Dan, thank you so much. Dan will be live for us from Washington, D.C. Let's talk more about the story and dissect the claims and the comments of Congresswoman Tlaiba Noma with tonight's panel. Joining us now is Jonathan Tobin. He's the editor-in-chief at the Jewish News Service and Matt Brodsky, senior fellow at the Security Studies Group. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. A lot to dissect here, Jonathan. Let's start with you. We had the representatives threatening aid to Israel, referring to the so-called occupation and pushing this false narrative that Zionism is the same as apartheid. What was your overall reaction to this press conference? Well, they're making the most out of a publicity opportunity for themselves. Um, the question of whether they should have been banned from entry is a bit moot now. I think it was uh, foolish, and I think it was uh, the 2017 law that bans entry of uh, people who advocate BDS is foolish. Um, that such advocates can do far less harm inside the country than they can outside by preening as martyrs, and we're seeing that played out now with Omar and Talib. But I think we're now beyond that, and now it's time to see what the blowback will be about this. And this creates an interesting test for, the, for their Democratic Party. Um, the point is, is that throughout this year, as we've seen Omar and Tlaib and the other members of the so-called squad grow in stature and uh, their ability to dominate social media and publicity and be on the late-night comedy shows, what we've seen is that they have a lot of influence. Now, do they have enough influence to cut aid to Israel? Of course not. But what they do have is the ability to manipulate even more senior members, even stalwart advocates of Israel, into making this into a big controversy. Um, you uh, mentioned before the uh, motion, the possibility of a resolution condemning Ambassador Dermer and Ambassador Friedman in Israel. Um, over the weekend, uh, Congress people uh, like Nita Lowy, um, the chairman of the Appropriations mm -hmm. Committee, and Elliot Engel, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, both senior Democrats, both stalwart advocates of Israel, but they were putting their names behind this. And now part of this is because they're afraid of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the other members of the squad backing a primary challenge to them. Their seats are in danger next year. So their influence is their ability to shift the Democratic Party, to take more anti-Israel stands, to virtue signal on this, rather than examine the real scandal here, which is the connection of two members of Congress to a virulently anti-Semitic organization like MIFTA, to their advocacy of one state solution, which is they're, they're advocating the extinction. Um, uh, Tlaib is very open about that. She's for the elimination of the one Jewish state on the planet. That's what Democrats should be investigating when we remember that Republican censured Steve King, a uh, uh, Republican from Iowa, who had some ties to white supremacist groups. Um, Omar and Tlaib have done far worse than yeah. them, and they're still Democratic rock stars right. rather than being isolated and punished as King was by the Republicans. Matt, we, we have the situation that Jonathan has just laid out to us of two members of U.S. Congress that are being celebrated by many in the Democratic Party, even though they have these very uh, close associations with groups like Miftah, even though they have advocated for a one-state solution. They're propagating blatant inaccuracies that Israel is the same as apartheid South Africa. And they're threatening to cut off aid to Israel. I mean, that's what this press conference was essentially about. Is this a real threat, though, now? I don't think it's as much of a threat because basically what they're doing is throwing a giant tantrum because they frankly were exposed for what they were trying to do. It was 
obvious now. <laughs> they basically snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. They had a PR victory for their very dangerous and ill-informed cause. And Talib, by rejecting the acceptance of her own offer, basically snatched <laughs> her defeat. And now she's running with it. So they have this press conference. President Trump has always thought that he wants to have a unified Democrat party, but unified behind Ilan Omar and Tlaib and AOC. So this is what he has. And time and again, the Democrats keep leaping off the cliff right after them. So this is going right, to play Matt. just fine, I think, for President Trump. Well, and forget, forget for Netanyahu as well. let, let's forget the, the, the politics of whether this is good for the president and good for his reelection. You can't deny that this is doing some damage to the Israeli-American relationship. I mean, you do now have a situation where it is being called into question. You don't think that that is the real fallout from all of this? Yeah, I think the real fallout here is that the Democrats are not standing up to this because the leadership is trying to say that this trend of Democrats toward anti-Israel positions is reversible, yet they're doing nothing at all to reverse it. And so they're making a very tragic mistake because they are going to, it's going to be portrayed during election time that these are the loudest voices. And unless they stand up and do something about it, which they've proven to have absolutely no ability or spine and able to do so, then this turns out fairly bad for them later on. So they can keep making these type of claims. But I, I thought to myself, I'm from originally Omar's district in Minneapolis. And these two congresswomen who accuse Jews of having dual loyalty, I thought to myself, what was in that press conference for anybody in those districts? Absolutely nothing. It's a tantrum that they're throwing about another country. It sure doesn't seem to serve America's interests at all. And this is what Democrats, the leadership, are allowing to happen. Matt, thank you so much. Matt Brodsky, Jonathan Tobin, uh, we appreciate uh, your perspectives and we'll continue to cover this story on Clearcut Plus. Now to another controversy, Democratic President.